Hey everyone, before we start, I just wanted to make a really quick correction to my last video where I called this group of Cnidarians Scyphozoa, when it's actually pronounced Scyphozoa. I found this out from a Journey to the Microcosmos video that came out two days after I posted my video, and at first I didn't believe it, I thought they were wrong, but the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute confirmed it in their video, there's no such thing as a jellyfish. I can't believe I got that wrong, I could have sworn that the word was pronounced with a hard K sound, but I guess Cnidarians are just really into their silent seas. Anyway, just wanted to clarify that, and on to my next video. Hi, I'm the Octopus Lady, you're watching Alien Ocean, and let's talk about sea cucumbers today, shall we? So we're throwing it back with these guys, all the way back to my first video where I talked about sea stars, because like sea stars, sea cucumbers are part of the phylum Echinodermata. To be a member of this phylum, an animal needs to have a couple characteristics, one of which is pentaradial symmetry, which is a type of symmetry where an animal can be split up into five equal parts. And you can see that pretty easily in a sea star, it's just like, boop, 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 boop. Ta-da! Pentaradial symmetry. But for a sea cucumber, it's a little bit harder to see, so I'm gonna cut to an awkward video I filmed in my kitchen on my Pixel 2 phone where I show you it using a regular cucumber. So sea cucumber pentaradial symmetry isn't clearly obvious from this angle. You have to take the sea cucumber and turn it like this. And then at that point, you can very clearly see its pentaradial symmetry. There's even lines on the regular cucumber to show it. Although not all sea cucumbers have pentaradial symmetry, it's dependent on whether or not they have tube feet. I don't know what I'm gonna do with this cucumber now. And speaking of tube feet, those are these. These are they. You've probably seen them on sea stars before, and echinoderms use tube feet for movement, feeding, and gas exchange. No, no, no. Gas exchange as in, like, breathing. Sea cucumbers that have tube feet only have them on the bottom of their body, which is why they technically don't have pentaradial symmetry. They have bilateral symmetry instead. Tube feet are connected to the water vascular system, another characteristic found only in echinoderms, which is kind of like a hydraulic pump system that mostly is used to control the movement of tube feet. It pumps seawater into the echinoderm's body through a special opening called the madreporite, which is often found on the surface of the echinoderm skin. From the madreporite, the water is then pumped through the stone canal, and then the ring canal, and then the radial canals, and down to the tube feet, which then extend or retract. Confused? Don't worry about it. You don't need to understand how the water vascular system works for the purposes of this video. Although if you're really curious, this video is actually a really great rundown of how water gets pumped through the WVS, as they say. Although once again, sea cucumbers are a little different from other echinoderms in that their madreporite is actually inside of their body, not on the surface of their skin, and their quote unquote water vascular system doesn't have any water in it, just body fluid. But I guess body fluid vascular system is kind of... It kind of sounds a little gross. Echinoderms also have an endoskeleton made up of calcareous ossicles, which are these small little calcified bits in their skin that provide structure and protection and come in all sorts of neat shapes. Depending on the animal, the ossicles can all fuse together and form something like a test, which is what this is. This is the test of a dead sea urchin. Or sometimes they're all attached to each other through connective tissue, making them more articulate and flexible like in sea stars. This connective tissue, which once again is found in all echinoderms, is called catch or mutable connective tissue because echinoderms have the ability to switch this tissue from from being hard and rigid to soft and flexible and back again in just a few minutes, or sometimes even seconds. Sea stars found in tide pools, for example, often have to endure very powerful waves that could easily wash them out to sea, and while they do technically have muscles, instead of expelling tons of energy continuously trying to cling to a rock, they can just wrap their arms around one and switch their connective tissue from the soft setting over to the hard setting, which locks their arms and themselves in place. Very energy efficient. Sea urchins use their mutable connective tissue, which is at the base of every one of their spines, to double up defenses against predators. If something is trying to eat them, they can just lock all their spines in place and essentially become a one animal Spartan phalanx. Okay, so to quickly recap, to be part of the phylum Echinodermata, you have to have one, pentaradial symmetry, two, a water vascular system, three, an endoskeleton made of calcareous ossicles, and four, mutable connective tissue. And the main Echinoderm classes include Asteroidea, which are the sea stars, Echinoidea, which are the sea urchins and sand dollars, and by the way, this is what a sand dollar looks like when it's alive. If you see a sand dollar and it looks like this, it's dead. But pop quiz, y'all. What is this calcareous plate called? Yes, an ossicle. And what is this whole structure called? The endoskeleton. That's correct. And knowing that sand dollars are very closely related to sea urchins, what is this kind of endoskeleton called? A test, which I'm sure all of you just aced. Gold star, everybody. Oh wait, where was I? Right, there is the class Ophiuroidea, which are the brittle stars. And in case you didn't notice, I've never heard this word pronounced out loud. I've only ever seen it written down, so 
Hopefully I got that right. We got the class of Crinoidea, which are the sea lilies and feather stars. And then last, but certainly not least, there's the class of Holothuroidea, which contains everyone's favorite cucumbers of the sea, the sea cucumbers. Also, really quick side note, did you know that sand dollars and sea urchins are also called echinoids? Sea lilies and feather stars are also called crinoids, and sea stars are called asteroids? Did you know that? It's literally the same word that we use for these. Now whenever you go to the beach and see sea stars, you can be like, look, asteroids, and be that obnoxious person who calls a common thing by its not common name and confuses everyone. Anyway, I've been talking a lot about other echinoderms. Let's get back on track. Sea cucumbers are found all over the world, and again, like barnacles and like jellyfish. There's no real point in highlighting where. I'm starting to wonder if this is a section of my video I should take out. Sea cucumbers are mostly benthic, which is a term basically meaning anything associated with or occurring on the bottom of a body of water. Or in other words, sea cucumbers crawl around, they don't really swim around. Although there are a handful of pelagic sea cucumbers, pelagic basically meaning anything associated with or occurring in the open ocean. Or in other words, they swim around, they don't crawl around. Most of the time though, you'll find sea cucumbers anywhere from the bottom of tide pools to the actual bottom of the ocean. By the way, did you know that this is a type of deep sea sea cucumber called a sea pig? Which makes it quite possibly one of the best named animals in the ocean. The oldest fossils we have of sea cucumbers are from the early Darawillian stage of the Middle Ordovician series, which is just a complicated way to say that they're about 458 to 469 million years old, which makes them the slightly older cousins to sea stars. Sea cucumbers are strange. I know that all the animals I talk about on my channel are strange, that's kind of the whole point of the channel, but sea cucumbers are they're strange, but they're like goofy strange. It's really hard to not crack immature jokes about them. Like, did this picture make anyone else feel a little uncomfortable? Is it just me? I feel like barnacles would have an appreciation for sea cucumbers, if you get my drift. If you don't get my drift, go watch my barnacles video. There's a species of sea cucumber whose common name is the Johnson's sea cucumber. That had to be intentional. Or look at this one! Sir, that is horrendously inappropriate! Put that away! Oh, did you know that sea cucumbers breathe with their butt? Or is this in their butt or is this in their- whatever, they're butt breathers? Sea cucumbers do breathe using tube feet like other echinoderms. The skin of tube feet is very thin, thin enough that it's easy for oxygen to go in and for CO2 to come out. Some species of sea cucumbers have what are called buccal podia, which are these beautiful frilly tentacle things that surround their mouth, and they're used for breathing as well, along with eating. Really quick side note, this is my favorite species of sea cucumber. They're called sea apples, and I love them so much! They're so pretty! Oh, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, sweetie. I didn't mean to imply earlier that you were my favorite. Oh, no, honey, don't cry. You're a really close second. Sea cucumbers primarily breathe through what are called respiratory trees, which are kind of like lungs, except they breathe in water and not air, obviously. These are attached to the cloaca, a chamber located right before sea cucumbers' anus. The cloaca is kind of like a rectum in the sense that it's the place where feces are formed in sea cucumbers, but also not because it's connected essentially to their lungs. So instead of breathing through their mouth like a normal animal, they pump water through their anus, into their cloaca, and to their respiratory trees, and breathe through their butt. They also potentially eat with their butt too. They call it anal suspension feeding. Studies show that sea cucumber respiratory trees can take in nutrients from seawater, which again, in case this wasn't made clear earlier, said seawater comes in through their butt. Finally, some species of sea cucumbers have been found to have fish living inside of them, pearl fish to be specific. But how do these pearl fish find their way into a sea cucumber's body and how do they get out when they need to go eat? Take a wild guess! That's right, through a sea cucumber's butt. And if that wasn't bananas enough for you, sea cucumbers self-eviscerate as a defense mechanism. Now I know what you're thinking. Actually, I have no idea what you're thinking, but if you've seen my sea stars video, I can guess at what you're thinking, and what you might be thinking is, well, sea stars self-eviscerate too, but I'm gonna stop you right there. Sea cucumbers are in a whole other level of self-evisceration. Because sea stars push their stomach out of their body to eat something, but they pull it back in when they're done. And it's only their stomach. Sea stars ain't pushing out any other organs. Sea cucumbers, just once they harve it all out, none of it is going back in and- Okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay, let's back this up. I'm getting excited and I get ahead of myself when I get excited. Sea cucumbers, despite being just kind of like tubes of meat, aren't a popular prey item. This is in part because a lot of sea cucumbers are actually really poisonous, producing a toxin called holothurin in their skin, but also some species eject sticky tubules laced with this poison out of, once again, their butt. Sea cucumbers have so much going on with their butts. This is not technically evisceration, but is often confused with it. These tubules are called cuvarian tubules, and I'm just gonna read this excerpt about them from my old invertebrate zoology 
psychology textbook because the last line is existentially horrifying in the absolute best way. When a tubule equipped cucumber is irritated or attacked by a predator, the anus is directed toward the intruder, the body wall contracts, and the detached tubules shoot out of the anus. Once ejected, the liberated tubules, which can extend to 20 times their original length, become as sticky as spider silk and quickly foul their target. Small crabs and lobsters are entangled and immobilized, dying slowly as the indifferent cucumber abandons them to their fate. Poetry. H.P. Lovecraft could never. But true sea cucumber self-evisceration is easily much more horrifying than that. One species of sea cucumber, Sclerodactyla briarius? I'm so bad at pronouncing scientific names, after being induced to inviscerate, reported as having spewed out the following. Their nerve ring. Sea cucumbers don't have brains, the closest thing that they have to it is a ring of nerves that's connected to the rest of the nerves in their body, but that's apparently something they don't need all the time. Their water vascular ring, which is kind of like the main hub of the water vascular system. Water can't really get into the rest of the system without the ring, which seems pretty important, but I guess not that important. Their tentacles? And I wasn't entirely sure what those were, but from context, text clues, I'm pretty sure they're the buccal podia, so these frilly arm tentacle things around the sea cucumber's mouth. One of the papers I'm reading describes the tentacles as a tentacle crown, which is what buccal podia look like to me, so I'm just gonna go with that and pop those off. If I'm wrong, feel free to correct me in the comments. Their lantern, which I thought I didn't know what that was either, but then... Okay, I just need to rant about this for a second. I spent way too long trying to figure out what a sea cucumber's lantern was, because looking it up on Google Scholar pulled up stuff like this, which... No, and looking it up on Google regular pulled up stuff about Minecraft for some reason? But I finally found this old paper from 1971 that says, the calcareous lantern consists of five radial and five interradial plates. The water vascular and hemal rings surround the posterior end of the lantern and provide radial da, da, da. This is just their calcareous ring. I've always known this is their calcareous ring. It's just a bunch of ossicles fused together in a ring that's located near their mouth and provides structure in a place for muscles and organs to latch onto. I wasted so much time trying to figure out something I already knew. <sighs> I got way off track. Anyway, their stupid lantern got upchucked too, along with their stomach and their intestines, their hemal system, which is their version of a circulatory system, and finally, part of a gonad. Basically all that was left of the sea cucumber when it was done was its body wall with its associated musculature and nerves, some connective tissue, and its cloaca. And I know what you're thinking! Well, again, I don't know what you're thinking, but you might be thinking, wait, this is a defense mechanism? How is this a defense mechanism? There is nothing left inside this animal. It should be dead right? Yeah, you would think. You would think that after vomiting up a bunch of its vital organs, it would just die. But no, this sea cucumber survived. And not only that, it grew all of this back. All of it. And sea cucumbers eviscerate themselves in so many different ways. They can self-eviscerate through their mouth or their butt. Or their, or their butt and their mouth, whatever. Some species tear a hole in the side of their body and yeet all their organs out that way, and there are some that just do this seasonally. This is just a yearly event for them, like Christmas, but no presents, just a lot of viscera. And remember that mutable connective tissue I mentioned at the beginning of the video? That plays a key part in sea cucumber evisceration. It's what makes up the mesentery, a type of connective tissue that holds organs in place. And when they switch it over into the soft setting, the tendons and ligaments inside their body go from a gel-like state to a liquid-like state. And then all a sea cucumber has to do is squeeze the muscles in their body wall and, well, I'm sure you can figure out the rest. And I thought sea stars were hardcore because of how they self-eviscerated. <laughs> Amateurs! After a sea cucumber eviscerates, they need to regenerate, obviously. They're actually absurdly good at regeneration in general. Most echinoderms are. Sea stars, for example, are pretty well known for their ability to completely grow back their arms, but there are sea cucumbers that can grow back from just a little disc of itself. Seriously, some researchers cut a little disc from the sea cucumber Leptosynapta crassipatina, which unfortunately I could not find a picture of, that only had its mouth, its nerve ring, and its calcareous ring, or lantern, and just from that, the whole entire animal grew back. Does that make anyone else feel deeply unsettled? There's something about the imagery of a disc of flesh with a mouth on it, being left alone at the bottom of a tank or something. It can't move, it can't eat, and yet it's still alive? 
don't know, it gives me the heebies. And I love that. Some researchers have also chopped up other species of sea cucumbers and found that the whole animal would grow back from that too, but only from the bits that had some of the cloaca in it. But in terms of organogenesis, which is a fun word to say and basically means organ regrowth, after self-evisceration, it's usually the intestines that grow back first from the mesentery. The hemal system, which isn't in this drawing unfortunately, grows from the intestines, the respiratory trees grow back from the cloaca, and the reproductive organs sometimes don't always grow back. It sort of depends on how much of it got booted. If the whole reproductive system got chucked, then it either doesn't grow back or it takes a really long time. And by a long time, I mean upwards of 100, 200 days. If the part with the gametes gets chucked, same thing, but if the gametes stay and everything else gets chucked, then the whole reproductive organ grows back without much fuss. Depending on the species and what organs got ralphed up, organ regeneration in sea cucumbers can take anywhere from just a week to about a month. And organogenesis in sea cucumbers seems to occur through a combination of morphalactic and epimorphic mechanisms, which are pretty big words, but they're simple to understand. Morphalactic regeneration means that the sea cucumber de-differentiates cells, migrates them, and then differentiates them again. Wait, that's more big words. Okay, so they essentially take cells that already are a certain cell type, so let's say these are cloacal cells in the cloaca, de-differentiates them, or in other words, removes all the characteristics that makes them cloacal cells and reduces them down to a very basic and unspecialized cell, then migrates them, so moves them from the cloaca to the location of where the new respiratory tree is going to be, and then goes through the process of differentiating them again, so makes them specialized again. And now these cloacal cells are respiratory tree cells. Epimorphic regeneration is when unspecialized cells gather at a wound site, so for example, the mesentery, and go through a bunch of cell division to help build new tissues. You know, they just mitosis cysts it up in there. And it's through both of these processes that the organs get regenerated. The biggest differences between the two is that in morphalactic regeneration, very little cell division occurs, and new cells are created just by remodeling and rearranging old ones, while epimorphic regeneration is basically all just cell division. Sea cucumbers are such a strange combination of a Spongebob character and a Lovecraftian horror monster. Oh wait, they did make a Spongebob character of a sea cucumber. Okay, imagine Kevin, but a lot more cosmically terrifying and a little bit less of a jerk. And despite some of their more sillier aspects, when I think of a cosmically horrifying creature, I don't tend to think of perhaps more obvious animals. I tend to think of sea cucumbers. I mean, tell me that this doesn't look like something out of a Jeff Vandermeer novel, or that this wouldn't be a good stand-in for the monster at Mystery Flesh Pit National Park. I don't know if anyone's gonna get these references. Anyway, I'm just glad that these little butt breathers spend most of their time chilling at the bottom of the ocean and not at the edges of our galaxy. All right, so first off, shout out to my patrons. Second off, I've been doing a little bit of research on how to get more views on YouTube videos, and there's a lot of advice out there that either doesn't really apply to my channel or I am just not comfortable doing. But one suggestion I see over and over again is to ask your audience a question to get engagement or whatever, which, okay, I, I get now why so many YouTubers ask really, I mean, honestly, like really boring questions at the ends of their videos. Like they ask questions like, what's your favorite species of sea cucumber? Which like, why? That is how, no one has an answer for that besides like me and like two other people in the entire world. Like no one's gonna respond to that question. Like we can do better. Like, okay, let's pretend that humans had the ability to vomit up our organs as a, as a defense mechanism and we can grow them back. Like what organs would you want to be able to to vomit up? I think like the liver is a, is a good choice. N not necessarily the whole liver, but maybe like a chunk of the liver, you know? As it's my understanding that livers grow back pretty well on their own already. The appendix is also, I think, a solid choice, but I don't have mine anymore, unfortunately. Uh, you know, you know, honestly, as someone with a uterus, that would be a, a, good, a good option to to throw up, I think. Especially if it took over 200 days to grow back. That would be, that would be really awesome. Anyway, leave a comment down in the comments with your answer and also hit that like button. W one like is equal to one sea cucumber that was able to grow back all of its gonads in less than 200 days. What am I talking about? <laughs> anyway, if you're still here, Thanks for watching our video. Feel free to subscribe if you haven't already. And as you can see, we have patrons. We have a Patreon, patreon.com slash the octopus lady, where you can get stuff like early access to videos or your name in the credits. Or maybe you just want to support the work here on we do on here this channel. I'm not re-recording that. And until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood octopus lady reminding you that you don't need to go into space to find aliens.